Hey guys, and welcome to the finale of Let's Play Chrono Cross. Last time we had more plot dumping, and I tried to explain things as best as I could. This game is still convoluted. There's still a little more dialogue in the ending, so let's try and put the astronaut in here. Does nothing. Let's try and put the uh, time egg over here. Does nothing. All right. The darkness and no end. Let's go. The final gate, which leads to the darkness of time. Like this is finally it. Not alone anymore, though that was never really part of your arc. I wonder if there was a missed cutscene with her, something to do with her and Nikki. Should probably bring her to go talk to Nikki, actually. Hmm. Don't want to keep the girl waiting any longer. She's only been waiting for you and only you for over 10,000 years. Scala's got a lot of patience. The world's going to be destroyed. Then let it be destroyed. History is going to be changed. Let it be changed. She gets part of a Magus quote from Chrono Trigger. Believe... When was that quote? It might have been in the developer's room ending. I don't remember where exactly that quote comes from, but I know it's a Magus quote. She gets part of it. Yes, she's kind of, sort of, ish his sister, so there's that, I guess. And... Here we go. The Time Devourer. And Scala there with him. For a game full of so much epic music, there's not much to the final boss. This is it. The Master Mune does not auto crit against the final boss. There are two ways of fighting the Time Devourer. One of them is will lead you to the bad ending and by bad i mean you see the time devourer break apart and that's about it and then it goes straight to the uh, credits marcy can you please hit something in order to get the bad ending you just beat up on the boss for a while. And eventually, after about 10,000 HP falls off of it, the battle ends. In the meantime, the boss is just going to keep spamming green elements. Sadly, a lot of the time, it's Omega Green. The only way to get the good ending is to pick up the Chrono Cross ahead of time. Then, you need to initiate the same sequence of sounds that we heard in Terra Tower. Starting with Yellow. Then red. Green. Blue.
black, and finally white. Once you've initiated all six colors in this particular order, battle is basically already over. Boss will do nothing, and all we have to do is use the Chrono Cross, and it ends. This leads to the good ending. And you get an achievement. There's also an achievement for getting the bad ending. I'll be doing that off screen. I love how they incorporate the music aspect of this fight into kind of its own ending. There is another ending theme that goes along with the credits. But this one just works so well for this scene. After 10,000 years, she's free. If I was a real dick, you would see a Power Rangers clip here, but I'm not interrupting this song, sorry. This song incorporates the Game Over theme and another theme that we uh, heard before, which are all uh, kind of show elements from the actual ending theme that plays during the credits. Been waiting an eternity just for this very moment. Meaninglessly hurting one another disappearing life forms. Love to hate, hate to love. Why are we born? Why do we die? Evolution, survival of the fittest. What is there to be achieved from harming one another, killing one another? The eggs that we call planets, the innum innumerable spermatozoa, life forms which gather around them. One of the countless seeds is joined with a new planet. A new universe is born. All of this exists for that one moment. All so the universe can evolve into the next dimension. Does that make us all just pawns? Each of our short lives nothing but cheap sacrifice, so that one chosen life form Not the case. Each and every one of us has a chance of becoming that one chosen life form. Is that a fourth wall joke? Each of us tries to do our best, and we're dealt. Be it our genes or the environment we live in, each life form struggling to make the best of the life that's given, forms a link, a golden chain that leads to the creation of a new universe. Every single thing in the whole of nature is perhaps just dreaming a dream of life. All of them are also perhaps nothing more than a dream dreamt by a planet before its birth. 
Eventually, all dreams will return to Zervan, the Sea of Dreams. Zervan is the name of a creator god in Zoroastrianism, an ancient Persian religion. The sea of Dreams, the game is mentioning here, it's probably a holdover from some aspect of the plot that never got thrown into the final game because this is the one and only time it's mentioned, the only time the Sea of Dreams is mentioned. It seems to come out of nowhere, and it leads to nothing. Everything is all right now. Time, which has been divided, will be unified again. Time for farewells has come. You will lose all memory this whole adventure and return to your own time. This time, you will be able to live your own life. With fate destroyed, we no longer have anyone controlling us. No one guiding us. Interestingly enough, uh, each character that you bring here, other than Kid and Surge, has their own unique dialogue here. And yet, for whatever reason, they never or they always seem to have their own text box. I'm not sure if it's different for each character, but they don't use the same one that we've been using all game long. It'll be a lot bigger. Okay, you're gonna grow up. How cool. We alone do not have the power to heal the world's woes or solve all its mysteries. But even then... Bloody good knowing you, mate. Thanks for being you. Guess now's the time to say see you later. I'll find you somewhere, sometime. Now, in Chrono Trigger, Scala did not speak with an Australian accent. I'm not sure whether they're trying to have this dialogue uh, be kid or if it's Scala. Earlier on, it was Scala. I don't know if they've made a change here and this didn't announce it. If they are going with Scala being, you know, having the Australian accent here, that's fine. It's just we never see any of that accent in any of the other dialogue we get from Scala. Neither in this game nor the next. Or the previous, sorry. No matter the time, no matter the world you live in, I'll find you. So yeah, most of what Scala just said there, sci-fi mumbo jumbo means absolutely nothing in the grand scheme of things. You could pick and choose and try and, you know, create some meaning out of it. It's more of just like a lesson of the day kind of thing that you would get in like a kid's cartoon from the 90s. Uh, I don't think it really matches a lot of the tone of what they did throughout the rest of the game. But if you like it and it works for you, all the better. It's not like it's terrible or anything like that. It's just I don't think it matches with the rest of the dialogue that we got from her over the course of the game. I think the fact that she talks about, you know, universe reproduction and all that kind of goes with what I was saying uh, in the previous episode about Lavos not being sentient and that being just pre-programmed to try and procreate. I think they might have been going in that regard. Like Lavos's are sent out to planets and that's the spermatozoa with the sperm and then the planet's the egg and they're supposed to create a good out of it, but they have to like overcome the evil. I I don't know what they were going for with that. That's just a thought. Anyway, 
in another one of my least favorite tropes in RPGs and any story, really. The end, you will forget. Don't ever make the characters forget. It makes the rest of the story not matter. Like it happened, but if they don't remember that it happened, what's the point? You passed out all of a sudden. Terra Tower? Fate? What are you talking about? We just got here. As Scala said, he went back when the worlds remerged. Though, for some reason, when the worlds remerged, Surge is still alive and retains his memory. Though, as you remember, another world was the true timeline. But this is the events of Homeworld. You sound confused. That's what happens when you try and understand Chrono Cross. You get confused as fuck. Summer's only just started. How could you tell there was any other seasons? You're in a tropical paradise. Thus, the curtain closes on another tale. Eternity is past. Fleeting dreams fade into the distance. All that's left now is me and my memories. We saw this book in the opening. I'm sure we'll meet again. Someday, you and I, another place, another time. It's just that we might not realize that you are you and I am me. Open the door to the great unknown. Come across another reality. Live another today. Even when the story has been told, life goes on. Till we meet again, take care of yourself. Forever yours, Scala Kid Z. Pay attention to this photograph. Scala. Who is the figure whose head is cut off by the camera? Is that a future image? Is that like Scala in the future and she's gotten together? Is that Surge? Is it Magus? Another little piece of evidence for that. Normally, I would shut up and let you enjoy what is a fantastic ending theme. But YouTube copyright monkeys have been terrible lately, so I'm going to talk all over this ending. If you want to listen to it, probably a video out there somewhere. Play the game, whatever. Okay, review time. This is going to take a while. I've got like four pages of this. <laughs> It's not fair to try and compare this to Chrono Trigger, but I'm going to anyway. As I talk about certain aspects of the game, I just, I just kind of have to. I don't expect this game to be as good as Chrono Trigger. Chrono Trigger was a once in a lifetime title with all the stars lining up for everything to just work out the way it did and all the talent involved. This game, it's not the same, but I love it nonetheless. Chrono Trigger has some of the best NPCs. Many of them talk about future quests, quirks of the people that we're going to interact with later, little bits and pieces about the world. Chrono Cross does this as well. 
and you need to talk to most of the NPCs to get those little details about this world and really understand it. I think the game falls a little short just because there are so many NPCs this time, but and, you know, some of their dialogue is a little bit longer, but it's not like a huge difference or anything like that. I just think it's easier when you've got like two sentences of your dialogue because of the limitations on a, on Crown Trigger, you know, of the hardware. But uh, yeah, that's just my thought there. The motivation for our characters. Eh, <laughs> it's lacking for the first half of the game. Anyway, we go from place to place, short term goals. Few of those relate to the main plot and the end of the game. Chrono Trigger, on the other hand, they give us the prediction that the world's going to come to an end within the first three or four hours. And then we spend the rest of the plot trying to prevent that from happening. Like we have agency. We know what we're going to do. We don't have any agency in Chrono Cross, and that really hurts how kind of the plot is laid laid out. Surge is kind of a problem. He has less personality than Chrono. Both, neither of them speak, but because of the way that the uh, character model of Surge doesn't really do anything, and with uh, Chrono, you know, his uh, sprite, the animation gives him more personality than we get to see from uh, Surge. It just even though Chrono doesn't really do anything that Surge doesn't do, he just naturally has more uh, personality that way. Yeah, there's just very little on Surge's part, and that's just that's not like bad writing. It's just it's a product of what style we had to deal with. You know, a silent protagonist just doesn't make for a good character. It's supposed to be a love story, Surge and Kid, I think, maybe. You know, I've talked about aspects of it that they might have gone for originally, but it seems more like they were going for a kind of a love story, maybe. And it's kind of rushed and awkward because even if you spend the most amount of time with Kid, she's still there less than half the game. And since Surge doesn't talk, we don't see his feelings. At least in Chrono Trigger, you saw Chrono's dreams about being married to Marley. It gave some implication that he had feelings for her. Okay, good enough. But here we get a couple of like him moving to go and see Kid as soon as he hears her voice uh, during a fight or an almost fight on after delivering Riddell um, to Hermit's Hideaway. So there's that. Like this is just so few. So. Yeah, because Kid is so important to the plot, it just seems weird to have, you know, her missing for so long. The meaning behind the cutscene you're seeing here is interesting. In a moment, you'll see she has the necklace that Kid had in the game. They talked about in the ending how the kind of, I will find you even if I have to search the world over sometime, somewhere. So the idea is, is there, I think they were trying to do something with this similar to what they were trying to do with uh, Neon Genesis. It was working through a lot of the problems that the uh, creator of that series had in his own life and he was just trying to work through a lot of his own problems and a lot of those stem from be him being kind of a lot more of a shut-in and it's it's just interesting to that they kind of seems to have thrown aspects of this at the plot and it almost comes around pushy the whole you know the humanity being the evil side of things us destroying the planet, etc. It almost seems pushy in a way, and I, I'm not a big fan of that, but it seems that might have had some semblance on what uh, they were going for with the uh, story. 
So yeah, that's kind of my idea on the characters. Um, I would talk about some of the other characters, except we don't have any. We have a thousand characters. I'm not going to give you analysis on 45 fucking characters. There's just not enough interesting aspects to them. You know, if you wanted to throw in a handful of characters, throw in Karsh and... Let's see, let's throw in Kid, Surge, Karsh, maybe Riddell. I think she should be an NPC. Uh, who else? Throw in Nikki. Throw in Guile, even though he has almost no characterization in the game. I just think you rework things. And have characters like Zoa, and, or maybe make it a choice. You get to choose Zoa or Karsh or Marcy as your party member, but you kind of see them all throughout the game. I, I just think you don't need as many characters as you have. I talked about it before when we were hunting level 7 techs. Go and set this up as like a side series, as an anime shonen battle thing, and then have us meet all of these characters, have their one episode of the day, and move on, because that's all the personality and characterization they get in the game anyway. So they don't need to be playable characters. I think cutting most of the characters would have been for the game's benefit. But, anyway. I'm not going to stare at this screen for... 10 minutes while I talk about the rest of it. Save game. We have a one slot left here to put the uh, our completed save file. You definitely want to do that because it's going to lead into our ability to do other things. But we'll throw this on the screen while I finish talking about the ending here. The story. The plot's got major implementation issues. Like, I like the idea. But from the plot dumping to the meandering nature of our objective all the time, it's changing every few, you know, few hours and we don't have any, nothing is pulling us through from start to finish until we find out later that fate was doing that. And it, you can't really tell the story the way that they did and have like, you can't tell the story they want to tell and not do that. It's just kind of, awkward to the the viewer and the player and all that like the, the story is so distracted as a whole but because of how much they hid from the player over the course of the game the story feels almost like three separate stories sewn together the first third of the game you know up to kind of i would say up to the confrontation at fort degronia that almost is a standalone game, a standalone story that you could have fleshed out a little bit more. And I think it probably would have been a decent, decent game. You know, I love the aspect of um, turning into the villain and having to find new allies to help us get our body back and being able to convince a lot of the people that we weren't able to convince before in order to help us and then, you know, eventually getting ourselves back. And then the third game is the plot dump at the end where they try and sew everything together in those first two legs of the game with Chrono Trigger and create one whole thing and it doesn't work. Anyway, I do like the meandering nature of the first part of the story on its own if it wasn't all drawn together the way that the final game is. I do actually like it. I like the exploration aspect. You know, you're given, you know, the world to explore and the different towns and the forces of work and the races. It's it's an interesting world that they've created. Like, I like a lot of aspects of it. It's just... I don't know. It's not terrible. It doesn't live up to the insane standards of Chrono Trigger and the insane standards that I had for the game as a kid. But I don't hold that against the game now. Like it, the story has its problems. It's definitely not perfect, but it's still an interesting plot, and I found myself enjoying it a lot this time around. The graphics are a total mixed bag. Right off the bat, it's colorful. I love color in games. This is why I hated Final Fantasy XII so much. You spend 12 hours at the start of the game in the fucking desert, and it's terrible. There's elements to 12 that I like, but we're not going to get into that. 
the biggest issue that I had initially was just everything was so lackluster in color. Everything was so muted. I love lots of color. And it's so much more engaging when the world is vibrant than when it's dull and lifeless. And this game, as you can see by what's on the screen right now, it works really well. Anyway, like the like the character models and the colors for the characters themselves are realistic. They just sprinkle in lots of color in and around everything. And I think that adds to uh, it adds to it and it makes it look really well. I think Final Fantasy VII Remake did this quite well, too, where they had the basic standalone colors where everything kind of made sense. And then they sprinkled in little bits of color here and there to just make things pop more. The cinematics in this game are fantastic. But as the years go by, the lower resolution kind of hurts them. Uh, they got a little bit of an upscale from AI and from the remaster here, so they're a little bit better than they were in my test run. But uh, still, you're looking at a 23 year old game. The low resolution kind of hurts, especially when you keep blowing them up to bigger and bigger screens. So it's only going to be as good as it can be. The background art is intricate, vibrant, well laid out. Everything just kind of looks really good and you, it's not like you really get too lost. You know where you can walk in this area, and I, in, in the game in general, and I, I really like that. The 3D art in the battles. Eh, the game kind of blew this one. Um, it looks good. The devs were obviously proud of it. The animations take bloody forever. And everything's so slow moving, it causes battles to drag even from the very start of the game. I, I can't tell you how many times I've actually turned on this game over the years to play because I heard some of the something on the soundtrack in one of my playlists. I was like, oh, I should play that again. And then I start playing. I was like, oh, yeah, the battles are droning and boring and I'm already bored of it. The only way to play back then uh, unless you're playing New Game Plus, was to use Fast Forward in an emulator so that you could skip all the animation, but then you missed out on all the music. And uh, having this one works really well. And now I think I'm going to have to reload the game to not sit on this screen forever. And there you go. We get to listen to this again. Lovely. All right, so what was I on here? We were talking about the animations taking too long. This was kind of the peak of this for Square because they would did this a lot in Final Fantasy IX too. It's probably Final Fantasy IX's biggest failing in my uh, mind. And by the time they got to uh, Final Fantasy X, they had actually fixed this. It was rather nice to, uh, to see that. Uh, they kind of got away from everything taking forever. And then they got to Final Fantasy 13 and beyond and everything is just a screen full of particle effects. And I can't tell what the hell's going on on screen. But then again, I'm an old man. So what do I know? The music is fucking phenomenal. I have talked at length over years about how much I love the soundtrack for this game. Case in point. I can't talk about how much I love the soundtrack or we would be here forever. Um, I am going to point out two main weaknesses. There's a few tracks that feel special in certain situations. You know where I'm going with this. <laughs> Talked about it 12 times this game. <laughs> they randomly play in other scenes and I feel they shouldn't because it takes away from their bigger moments. A couple that come to mind, Isle of the Damned. It would be more impactful if we didn't already hear it. Oddly enough, the place that we already hear it leads me to talk about the next point. Mojo. People see us with life plays in a scene with Mojo, as does the Isle of the Dam thing play, plays when you go into the fisherman's basement and you talk to him and Mojo for the first time. I think they would work better if they were just where they were and they didn't have to be anywhere else. There's a few good spots for people seized with life. And I think there's only one really good spot for the Isle of the Damned thing, and that's on the Isle of the Damned. It has more impact that way. The other weakness, 
is the battle theme. The battle theme's not good. Um, it doesn't fit as a battle theme. It conveys like this edge of nervous energy and it puts me on edge and it would have worked fine as I've talked about before for an escape sequence. I think that's really where it should have been placed. You know, our party's being hunted down or cornered or chased. But as a battle theme, I don't care for it. For me, a battle theme needs to fill me with energy and the battle theme in Chrono Cross doesn't. Uh, it's just irritating. Something with energy and kind of like a really good beat, that really does it for battle themes for me. And I'll give you a couple of examples here. Brandia 2 had a fantastic battle theme. They even reworked it into a super determined final dungeon theme, and it worked. Legend of Dragoon has a few battle themes. A lot of them have a good beat that keeps me kind of into it. Um, the ones that you get in the Forbidden Land specifically come to mind, and I keep kicking them back. Oh well. A couple other ones that really come to mind that uh, really worked. I, I sound like a broken record here. Chrono Trigger <laughs> and the original version of Final Fantasy X, not the uh, remastered one. There was just a lot more umph in the original version uh, before the remastered uh, version of the song there. One other one that I want to bring up is Xenosaga Episode 1. Go and listen to that song if you haven't heard it in a while, because it starts out with that kind of uneasy feeling, that strain, almost panic, and it works perfectly for Xenosaga. But then the beat kicks in and you get that heroic accomplishment kind of feel from it. You know, you're going, you're going, you're going to kick some ass. And Chrono Cross, it never gets there. It's my least favorite uh, song on the entire soundtrack. I really, really dislike the battle. It's not a bad piece of music. Like this isn't like a, a big complaint, but the choice to have no music except for ambience in the first leg of the final dungeon kind of a disappointment. Same with the uh, final battle uh, theme. After so many good themes in this game, they just went with ambience. In the second leg of the uh, final dungeon, Terra Tower, we do get a song and it also leans heavy on the ambience and it works for the area, so it's fine. We have to wait to the third leg of the dungeon, the uh, scene and the plot dump in the library to get Dragon's Prayer, which is the uh, theme that played there. It's a fantastic song. I absolutely love that theme. I don't even think I had a chance to talk about it because there was so much plot dumping going on, but it is fantastic. It does so many things well. The battle system. The battle system, it's not a lot of fun, and it goes back to how what I talked about with the graphics. It's kind of a personal thing for me. I don't know if other people would agree, but the nature of the animation kind of kills the pace of combat and it just, it doesn't make me want to play. And it gets worse as you go uh, progress in the game and you start fighting enemies that interrupt you constantly and miss constantly. And the, just the pace of the game is not really as kind of, let's go move on as it should be in my opinion. I just like the the element system. I like that idea. Like it worked really well in Final Fantasy VII. The implementation here just isn't all that good. You know, the elements, they're so easy to come by. I have so many elements and I don't even use many of them because they're just not that good. But they don't feel special. Even when you're like, when you get one for the first time, it's like, okay, it's special for an hour, and then you get a whole whack ton of them, and then it's like, okay, it's just another element, whatever, fine. And most of the the characters, they all, they don't feel special, they don't feel different in combat, they're all the same. I talked about all the red innate characters all having basically the same stats, they basically have the same text, they're all interchangeable, there's nothing really special about them. Overall, like with the gameplay, I, I I like the island setting. Uh, it gives us new reasons to revisit the islands uh, over the course of the game for different reasons. The differences between worlds give us more reasons. We keep going back. It gives us something different to see. It's taken me a while to appreciate it, I think. Um, that I think there's a kind of a trapped nature of the game in terms of 
never being able to leave El Nido. As a kid, there is nothing more than me wanting to go and leave El Nido and see what happened to the world of Chrono Trigger in the 20 or so years since. And even now, I still wish I had a chance to explore that. But considering the narrative that they decided to make, there was no way that that was going to happen. And it would have made things even more convoluted and complicated, and it wouldn't have worked. I like that we eventually become our enemy, got to find all the new allies again. The Dragoons finally come around and they understand and they agree with me. It takes them a while, but they finally get there. The side quests, there's a number of them that are actually pretty good. Um, not on the level, like there are some that are definitely on the level of Chrono Trigger, but uh, not as many. And uh, I think I would rather go with the side quests that we get for this game over most of the ones that we get in current games, because I don't want to go fight 40 hunts. I don't want to do a thousand fetch quests. There are games out there that are just built around fetch quests and they they build up the world, but they build up the world in regards to side characters that we have no investment in. Side quests should build up the characters we have. The Master Mune quest with Karsh and Dario and Riddell and building up that whole story. Fantastic. So well done. Great reward. Saving Marbule builds up more character for Nikki and for Fargo and Irene's, and then it leads into Saving Marble, giving us access to rainbow equipment. It's fantastic. And the music for both of them. And the orphanage should have been required. It's that damn good. Anyway, that's that's just kind of my thing. The music is phenomenal across the game, as I said. I'm on the fence about the progression of the story, kind of our ability to explore, uh, like because we get to explore the islands a lot. And once you've played the game a few times, though, you realize that you're even though you get a chance to explore, you're still very much locked into a very linear path. Um, there's like, OK, you can explore the Dragon Islands, but there's nothing there. There's very few people there and it doesn't really do all that much for the development of anything until eventually, OK, we have to go there now. Now it's part of the plot. But up until then, there's very little going on there that would ever make you want to go back. The main island and Gulduff are really where the exploration lies, and it feels kind of cramped a little bit. I, I'm not explaining it very well. It's it's both cramped and wide open at the same time. It's Something's just off. I, I, I don't have I, I even wrote some notes here trying to put it together and I just gave up because I could not put my uh, finger on what it was. My biggest issue is I don't know what I would change to make it so that it doesn't feel off. So I'm criticizing it for not being what I think it should be, but I'm not giving any good help on what it is should be and that's unfortunate i wish i could have offered some type of better opinion on it i hate the 45 characters it's dumb already talked about this uh, i think it's technically 44 uh links and surge being the same one i guess but uh yeah i don't like how long the animations take i don't like how little time you spend with kid and how much he has to do with the story I don't like how convoluted the story is in the last quarter. I don't like the delay in the menus. There's a little delay in the menus where you have to wait extra time. It's tedious. My issue with the game isn't really one thing. It's a combination of a lot of little things and the even some big things that plague the game throughout and make it less enjoyable than I really hoped it would be, especially considering its legacy. But all that said, I enjoy the absolute crap out of this game, and I've had one hell of a time making this LP. 
I love that making LPs gives me a new approach on all the games that I play, and it gives me a new appreciation for aspects of that game that I hadn't considered because I'm usually rushing through aspects of the game that I specifically take time to explore in LPs. I probably enjoyed this playthrough more than any other. Uh, outside the first one, I really, really enjoyed this playthrough of this game a lot. It's Even with all the issues, I still enjoy the experience of this game a lot. The music always draws me in, makes me react far more emotionally than I otherwise would. You guys have seen what I've allowed you to see uh, instead of, you know, the uh, inability of me to talk for, you know, 30 seconds where I had to compose myself, especially during the uh, the letter to uh, from Luca to Kid. That one that one always breaks me. But yeah, all the complaints I've made, it, it goes back to some of the other games that I've complained about and specifically any sequels. I always hold them up to a very high standard if I like the previous game. And every time I do that, I always pick them to pieces. But it's not because I hate them. It's because I want them to be perfect. And they'll never be perfect. That doesn't mean I don't enjoy them. I enjoy the hell out of this, and I would recommend anyone who's played Chrono Trigger, you really do have to play this game. Whether you're playing the original or the remake, I would recommend the remake just because it's easier than trying to dig out a PlayStation out of who knows what closet, but uh, yeah. Anyway, that's pretty much all for the finale. I think I've said my piece on a lot of things. I wrote out a lot more for my review this time. Normally I just give myself notes and then I try and talk through it. This time I wrote out a lot of what I have been talking to you about and then glanced over. It's like, okay, that's what I was saying. But that's not all. There are more episodes to come that would be easier to show you once my uh, controller wakes up. Once you make that save file, the end of the game will be indicated in yellow stars. You load it up. You now have options of New Game Plus and Continue Plus. There are a bunch of endings for this game. I think the uh, achievements list 11. For you to get in this game. I will be showing all of them. The reason why we made specific saves throughout the game, we don't have to just go New Game Plus. We can continue plus from any of the save files that we've made along the way, allowing us to bring all of our gear, elements, etc., to that point in the story allowing us to defeat the Time Devourer right then and there. Over the next little bit, we will be going through and showing off all the endings, a new optional boss, not new to the remaster, at least I don't think there's a new one to the remaster. Again, still haven't researched much about it other than the handful of random things that I've seen. I haven't specifically gone out to look for anything. But there is an extra boss that you will probably enjoy if you enjoyed this game. It's a bunch of endings. There's a few more level 7 tech ob obtaining scenes that I can show off. And there's getting all party members in one file. Anyway, like I said, that's pretty much all for this one. And all. See you guys next time.